Marius made a radical break from the ideology of the apartheid system when a young man. He then joined the underground and then banned ANC and the Communist Party of South Africa when the ANC's strategy was to target communication systems rather than engage in the armed struggle. Marius served 12 years in prison from 1964. He and his second wife, Jeanette Curtis, who was a political activist and trade unionist in her own right, fled South Africa in 19, 1976. And they trained recruits from South Africa to go back and work underground to build the capacity of the ANC back home. After a tip-off from the British High Commissioner that their lives were in danger, the ANC deployed the family to live and work in Angola. It was while they were working as university teachers in Lubango, which is in southern Angola, that Jenny and their six-year-old daughter, Katrine, were killed by a letter bomb sent by Major Craig Williamson of the South African Secret Services. After the funerals in Luanda, Fritz and Marius arrived in Dublin and stayed with the Asma family. Marius and Fritz had refugee status um, at the time, but were granted Irish citizenship, which was facilitated by Senator Brendan Ryan and Garrett Fitzgerald. And this is the time when we first met. Um, our strike started in 1984. It was our union passed a motion for the boycott of all South African goods and services. The union had to decide if it was going to give it to rank and file members or if it was going to put it on a shelf and let it collect dust. So they decided that they'd give it out to the workers. Um, we informed the management in Dunn stores where we were working at the time that we were boycotting South African goods. We were all very young, we knew very little about South Africa, we knew very little about the apartheid in South Africa. Mary Manon had a customer approach her with two outs band grateful and Mary politely informed the customer that she couldn't take for them because of um, the union instruction and the customer was fine but the management decided to suspend Mary indefinitely until she changed her mind. So Mary clapped out and 11 people clapped out with her. You know, people were saying, oh, like the first few weeks, like there was 10 women and one man and we were walking up and down and the weather was really nice. And then of course, after that, the weather changed, but it was like, oh, you are silly, you are too young, you know, you know nothing about it. We didn't know anything about it, but we weren't long about learning. I think Marius had a profound effect on everyone in that, like he had lost so much. He could have had a very privileged life in South Africa but he, he was totally against the system in South Africa. One of the key things that I was asked to do this evening was to ask Sherry, of course, to unveil the mural. Find the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> I'd very like to call on anybody, and I'll start with you, Gary would like to talk about your experience maybe around the, what was going on around that time and Marius involved in COLO and involved in the anti-apartheid movement. So Gary, do you want to say a few words? It is great to welcome Sherry back to Dublin on behalf of the anti-apartheid movement or the old anti-apartheid movement. As a member of COLO for many years, and as a founder member of the anti-apartheid movement in 1964, and we were there right on 1994, unfortunately, People have short memories about the good work done by the anti-apartheid movement, uh, and I think especially of Marius. Marius was a member of the anti-apartheid movement. Marius was a particularly wonderful man, in as much as Catherine has said, he could have had a life of privilege as a white man in South Africa. And as an Afrikaner, it was most unusual for an Afrikaner to stand up for the rights of the black people. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Marius Kuhn when he came to Ireland uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and hoping to make a home here um, and I was involved in some of the difficult and strange dealings of dealing with the authorities here that address issues of citizenship uh, for him. Although I'd met a number of South Africans up to that point, Mary Schoon struck me as quite different and I cannot even begin to imagine the journey that he must have made in his decision 
uh, to support the struggle against apartheid and what that meant for his family and for his friends and his colleagues and the Afrikaans community in which he grew up. And that brings me to the principal issue which I'd like to speak to you about for the next five minutes or so, which is dissent. Okay? It's quite easy to hold political opinions and to disagree with the prevailing political centre ground if it doesn't involve any cost. And the expression of most opinion, and thankfully in Ireland most opinion, does not involve a cost. But it's an entirely different matter if doing so endangers your job, as was the case with the Duns store strikers, or know that your life, as everyone from Sophie Shaw onwards knows, is going to be in danger as well. Because we do have a dissent problem in Ireland today. It's a subtle one, it's a different one, but it's an important one. So, finally, you'll be pleased to know, I'd like to call on Mark Cumming, who was appointed Head of Koloff in July 2013. Koloff, going back to its roots now, it's about a space. I say to colleagues, you know, be tongue in cheek, it's not an NGO, it's not a charity, it's not a not for profit, it's not a voluntary organisation, it's a space. And people kind of look at me quizzically and say, What do you mean it's a space? It's a space where people can come together, it's a space where people have come together over the years to make and shape things that they wanted to work on, things that maybe they can't do in the mainstream organisations that they're involved in. People ask me where Colob is going to go, and I said, well, I don't know. We'll make the space and we'll see what people want to do when they come together. And that's what we're driving back towards now in terms of going back to our roots. Um, and so over the years, what we've seen is, again, you know, Colob, the first organisation in Ireland to, to advocate for the right to work for asylum seekers and refugees, import fair trade products into Ireland. And there are many, many other firsts. And so the work continues. Um, we estimate in 2012 over 2,000 people were involved in international volunteering from Ireland. So the need for COLOV and the role for COLOV has never been greater than ever before. And we're working with over 40 organisations in Ireland, uh, sending organisations and promoting good standards and good practice in volunteering. And what permeates all through that work is this development education reflex. That, that kind of free area perspective on getting people involved and so here now, in our new home, we're making space again. And we're delighted to have downstairs, where you, where you came in, the Mary Shoon members room. And it's deliberately the members room. And we're making, people are coming in in the evening, different groups are coming, including groups that maybe are working on local issues here, um, but are working from a global justice and a rights perspective. And we're really keen to see that kind of merging and connecting between those involved in international development, in international rights work, with those active here. When people come to me and say, oh, I'd like to volunteer with COLOV, I say, no, we're not looking for volunteers. We're looking for members. We're looking for people to get back into the room and who are interested in the issues, who want to connect up with other people and work on the things that they believe are important for them now.